I'm going to start today with a bit of a controversial thought. Please. Uh, obviously, we're going to get to some of the corrections. Mm-hmm. You know, we've, the uh, various many corrections. It's, well, this, it's, it's been a week. What what happened? Happened? People were wrong? No, <laughs> n- never me. I, I blame society <laughs> mostly for, for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, which is honestly, it's right on, right on task. Is Andrew's Andrew? Like, is that their Andrew? Yeah, I don't know. Well, he did use uh, Andrew as a pseudonym, but we'll get to that. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, are I'm we sure? St- I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> oh my god! Oh god! But this is my thinking, right? This is bad kid, sure. Andrew's Brevik, bad kid, naughty boy. Naughty yeah. boy. Yeah. You know, naughty boy. People, you know, punched hard for four year olds. Extremely dangerous. You, no one knew what to do with him. But imagine if there was just one magical afternoon where Michael Jackson. <laughs> could have chosen Anders Breivik. Right, that's how you actually pronounce it. Yeah. Brought him to Neverland went, brought him to Neverland Ranch one time. And had the monkey rip him to shreds. Wait. <laughs> that would be incredible. Either way, we think about what good it would have done yeah. for that little boy to play with the llama. Yeah. yeah. Go on the train. I was looking at a bunch of old pictures of Neverland Ranch, um, and let's say it did fall into disarray. And yeah. it seemed that he was distracted by a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, he was trying to go back on tour. He was he was feeling super sleepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was getting his, I can get my milk every night. But man, I just think about that. Like, maybe he needed some of that joy. I watched the old Michael Jackson Super Bowl performance that he yeah. did. And when he had all of those kids dancing in unison at his whim, <laughs> I just thought, man, Anders Breivik should have been there. Yeah. And like, man, I just feel like a little bit of joy, a little bit of dun dun like could have like helped him. Yeah. I bet he wouldn't have liked it. He looks like Macaulay Dolkin. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the last podcast on the left, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus Parks here with Henry Zabrowski. You're not Marcus Parks. I'm Marcus Parks. That's fun. Yeah. No, don't try to forget. Marcus, <laughs> <laughs> Henry, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, all you're trying to do is take all the shit you got wrong last week and put it on me. You got shit wrong too. Uh, my. I love that. <laughs> it's fun not knowing anything. Yeah, uh, isn't it nice to stay ignorant? And know nothing is. <laughs> Ed Larson. Hello! I'm an idiot! <laughs> and thank you for saying it. Boogers are delicious. You shouldn't say that anymore because you blew my fucking mind to the top yeah. of side stories last week. Do you know that picking your nose has given people Alzheimer's? Is that you? Yeah, I saw that fear. percent of people with uh, Alzheimer's pick their nose. I yeah. love picking my nose. We all do. My nose. I love it. Yes, yeah, yeah. man. It's, so it's bacteria from Wash your finger. Wash your hands first before you pick your nose. Wear yeah, gloves. No, but Sanitizer. that's the thing. Is that's the great thing about picking your nose? It's an absent-minded thing. I know, but Unfortunately. now you got to think about it just a little bit. Okay. One more thing to hyper-focus on, and I'm just thank God I am gifted with the superpower of OCD hypervigilance that yeah. allows me to really dig in. I yeah. just been snorting fucking antibacterial soap, and everything's fine. <laughs> really, it gets you fucked up. <laughs> cool. Well, here we are at Anders Brevik Part Two. I don't like saying Brevik. It makes me feel weird because I don't like putting the word brave into his name. Also, he's a not, fucking coward. It's Fuck not him. though. He's, also, we could call him whatever the hell we want. We yeah, call him Mr. Tushy Pants. <laughs> he should be Mr. Tushy Pants. <laughs> I would actually then go as far as to call him Panders Brevik. <laughs> you know, like, but he is a, a. You know, it's hard because because it, it gets Anders Brevik. That's how you get it, Norwegian. Yeah, but I'm not going to see. Also, say- Norway is not scam. Iceland is not Scandinavia. I talked to my fr- I talked to my friend Addy this morning, who is an Icelander, and I ran it by him, and he said that Icelanders are culturally Scandinavian, oh God, but not sounds, geographically Scandinavian. Sounds like yes. in the middle of somebody else's manifesto. And that, and that was from a man named Adustin Jorgensen. I know, uh, yeah, I, 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 I believe him. But I got yeah. several strident wooden emails from people saying that it is not Scandinavian. Yeah, his whole thing. Yeah, and then he went on to talk shit about the Norwegians and the Swedish for them bastardizing the fucking Iceland language because the Icelandic language is the original language of Scandinavia. I'm starting to see what's going on here. I'm <laughs> yeah. starting to see an interstatehood kind of rivalry <laughs> happening and we are now in this entry. Yeah, they got the three little droopy dicks. That's Scandinavia. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. Culturally, but not geographically. I just don't... I, I'm with everyone. Yeah. That's what you gotta do. So by the time Anders Breivik turned 30, he'd almost disappeared into the world of online right-wing extremism completely, but he still had tenuous connections to the real world. According to former friends, when they took him out for his 30th birthday, the only topic of conversation Breivik wanted to spend time on was the book he was writing. He was such an overbearing, Mm. bore, Mm. and piece of shit 
twenty four seven, and it's just it's hard because I did some reading into online radicalization sure. after this because like that idea of someone going away, yeah, for five years and then coming out of a room full of farts <laughs> like a different guy, yeah, is interesting. But it it really shows that a lot of times like it's online radicalization is so much faster. Than in person radicalization. It is. Like you watched it happen. But uh, for a long time, I didn't understand why. Well, I was like, so, but why? And, but it's really, there's like a, I'm, I might be talking a little bit out of school here, so feel free to correct me. Side stories, LPOTL at gmail.com. But the idea that our biological brains or the meat in our heads are not supposed to be subject to so many different thoughts at any given time and that's so much information yeah. at any given time. And that you truly, like back in the day, they used to have, you know, because we talk about when hate went online, mm. they were like first up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stormwatch is one of the oldest sites on the internet. Yeah. Like they were right. And as soon as the internet started, there were hate groups online and it started in forums, but they always viewed awful line evangelism as like crucial like you have to go to a gun show you have to go to a place you have to do these things you meet up with people someone has to hand you the protocols of the elders of zion yeah because again that's how you know locally sourced (laughs) but it's also we joked about it last time about how like you know even members of al-qaeda would like hang out you know i mean they would go and have barbecues and shit like and there was like a social contingent to the offline evangelizing of hate groups yeah but then like basically shows that if you're online it's so much easier to because like there's no side quests online. There's no hanging out. There's no joking around. You guys are all just talking hate all day long, getting pumped full of ideology, and it ramps up the effects of being in this echo chamber where you like you have no other thought outside of your little world. Well, basically, it create it, it shifts your reality. Yeah. Like you you have this own bubble of reality, and that's what Henry was telling me earlier today is like the more you. And the more you ingest this reality or the more you ingest this information, the more it becomes, oh, this is what the world is. Sure. Like, this is it completely because our brains are trained to do that. Yeah, and well, the, before the internet, there were like checks and balances on what we read a little bit. Well, you it's know? also our reality is created by the information that goes into it and the and the data. So eventually, if you if that's the only data that's going into it, that's how you're going to see the world. And then he's going out. Right, so now he's spending all day inside. And his Brevik. And his Brevik. He's going out. He's fucking playing World of Warcraft 24-7. He's, he's got no job, no, nothing going on. Uh, he, but when he goes out with his so-called friends, they all are like, when he starts spouting off his horse shit, all of his buddies are like, you know, that's fucking wrong, right? Or like, that's stupid. Or well, you're we don't like you anymore. Well, his buddies at this time, like he's keeping all this shit hidden. Like yeah. he's when he's a 30, he's going out for his 30th birthday. He's not talking about the Arabia theory. He's not talking about Muslims. He's just talking about the Knights Templar. Ugh. Like, cause that's the thing. He that didn't... sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> cause he didn't tell his friends that the vast majority of the book he was working on was extremist right wing rantings. Yeah. He told his friends, I'm working on a book about the Crusades. And specifically, I'm focusing on the Battle of Vienna in 1683. But focusing on this battle was a potent right-wing Islamophobic dog whistle if you knew the story behind the battle. Well, you know... Like, his friends could probably infer when he started talking about the Europeans defending themselves against the Muslim hordes that he's probably got some bad opinions. Yes. But he's not out and out openly talking about this shit. I just just find it interesting... Because he's a coward. He is a coward. And I just find it interesting that he... He, like, did have to hide his right-wing views because he knew that they wouldn't be into his right-wing views. And so every single time he would try to, he would, he began to be more and more separated mm-hmm. from society because he's he's isolating himself because he's going back to the same places that all make him feel good about the horrible things that he's saying. Do you think if he did it, like, without a gun or without a weapon at all, like, hand-to-hand, would that make him not a coward? <laughs> <laughs> I'd think about it more. <laughs> he's just walking around town beating people up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He'd just be I'd another pu- local psycho. Yeah, he's just, yeah, he's punching at people, yeah. kicking a baby, you know, like, you know, pissing on a water fountain. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Battle of Vienna, the thing that Anders Breivik was focusing on, that has become a legendary milestone in the minds of extreme right-wing radicals due to the fact that it involved a Muslim force invading a European city and failing. The way the right looks at it, the Islamic Ottoman Empire attempted to take the Holy Roman Empire city of Vienna, but because Europe came together to repel the Muslim hordes, never again did a Muslim empire attempt an invasion of Europe. Now, the reality of the Battle of Vienna is 
Naturally, not so simple. No way! <laughs> All of Anders Bravik's writings were a, a, a fucking gradation of a fortune? <laughs> the Muslims just excited to ride the Ferris wheel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, the Holy Roman Empire did include Vienna, but the empire itself was not a country in modern terms. Instead, it was a collection of hundreds of territories throughout Central Europe that each had its own ruler, with a single emperor ruling over the large, albeit decentralized, confederation. Mm. Got it? Yeah, all right. As a result, only about half a dozen out of the 1,800 territories of the Holy Roman Empire participated in the Battle of Vienna. Although, it must be said that a lot of these territories were tiny estates ruled by imperial knights rather than major kingdoms or duchies. But even so, half a dozen isn't a lot. And the only European powers outside of the empire that joined the Battle of Vienna were Poland and a smattering of other Eastern European territories like Transylvania. Oh shit, Dracula! <laughs> oh dear! I guess the Muslims can't beat Dracula! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be so mad if Dracula becomes like a right-wing figure. I, I'm going to be really <laughs> upset. <laughs> ah, I do not drink Jewish wine. <laughs> what? <laughs> Put away the Manischewitz. Dracula's coming. <laughs> well, in other words, while different powers did come together, this was by no means the great gathering of the white race that the extreme right believes it to be. Nevertheless, it has become a potent symbol to the Islamophobic authors that Anders Breivik was consuming on a daily basis. It's just these, the, it's the, they're literally just like, hacky tropes mm -hmm. within the world of right wing thought. Well, they're looking at it like an action movie. Yeah, you know, sure. they're not there is everything is simplified and yet highly convoluted at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, around 2009, Brevik spent less time playing World of Warcraft and more time on either a smattering of extremist right wing websites or badly written self-published books by authors who didn't even have the balls to use their real names. Of course, because uh, it's interesting that they it's I find it interesting that they all have to hide something that they're all so supposed to be proud of. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing with the Klan. It's like if they knew they were right, they wouldn't wear the fucking hoods. Yep. Well, but they were safe against COVID. <laughs> and honestly, I think that's one of the nicest things that the Ku Klux Klan could have done for themselves. Well, among the more odious writers was a guy who went by the name Fjordman, real name Peter Jensen. And most of his writing outside of his most popular self-published book, Defeating Arabia, could be found on a hate blog called Gates of Vienna, named after the aforementioned battle. Fjordman was Anders Breivik's favorite writer. Oof, oof, I love this guy. I want to do a meet and greet. But apparently, <laughs> it is a dour meet and greet. <laughs> now, Brevik didn't reach out to Fjordman immediately. Instead, Brevik cut his extremist teeth on the comments section of a far-right website called document.no. There, Brevik found that writing hate-filled conspiracy rants about Islam and the Western media's complicity in its own destruction, that shit got a lot of positive attention. Attention. 